Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Season 7 of Your History, Your Story, and Happy New Year to you all. We've got lots of great stories coming up this season. So make sure to follow us on social media. There'll be a link in the show notes for that. And thanks a lot for your continued support. We really appreciate it. Today, we begin Season 7 with a popular returning guest, Marty Blumberg. Marty was on our show back in Season 3 talking about his first book, My Brooklyn, My Way. Marty has recently published a second book called Going Back to Brooklyn. It's a fun coffee table book filled with stories and poems about his experiences growing up in Brooklyn during the 1950s. His poems and the stories behind them are Marty's way of describing his wonderful childhood and preserving Brooklyn's rich history for future generations. I'd now like to welcome Marty Blumberg to our show. Welcome, Marty. Uh, Thank you, James, for inviting me and Kelly, and I'm pleased to be here. I should actually say welcome back to Your History, Your Story podcast because this is your second time on our show. Second time, almost two years already. Yes, and we asked you back because, first of all, we we had so much fun, I got to say, so much fun interviewing you about your first book, My Brooklyn, My Way, which was really your memoirs uh, about growing up in Brooklyn. It was just a fantastic book, but you are a great storyteller. And today we're having you back to talk about your new book called Going Back to Brooklyn, a collection of essays, photos, and poetry about the 1950s. This book is amazing. I'm thinking, gee, I know Marty mentioned he was working on another book, but what else could he, what else could he write about Brooklyn? I mean, he, he covered so much in his first book and the discussion we had, and I got your book and went through it. And first of all, there's so many wonderful photographs in it, but it's filled with poems and also introductions about the poems. So I just had a lot of fun reading it, and we're so glad to be able to talk about that book right now. So is that okay if we go ahead and do that? Uh, Go right ahead. I'm all set. (laughs) Terrific. And actually, I'm out on Long Island today interviewing you. So your History, Your Story podcast went on the road to visit with you, Marty. That's terrific. So first of all, I want to ask you, what inspired you to write your second book, Going Back to Brooklyn? And what's different about the two books? Sure. Well, in January of 2020, I published my first book, which you mentioned, uh, My Brooklyn, My Way. And I never wrote before, and uh, it seemed overnight, maybe because it was right before COVID uh, started, and people uh, wanted something to read. They wanted something to do. They were bored, staying home. And the book took off. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I didn't think it would have such an impact on the average person. Not only the people from Brooklyn, but basically all around the United States and certain situations in other countries. It had an effect on a lot of people because at this time, sitting around in their house with COVID and not being able to go to restaurants and shows, uh, it gave them a chance to think a little bit. And I think this book opened up their uh, minds of what's going on when they were younger, the things that they did, the things they shared. So that took me into about a year and a half later when I was thinking, you know, you write a book, people read it, they love it, they put it on their bookshelf and they forget about it. Uh, I thought what I would do in this particular book, Going Back to Brooklyn, is to make a large 8.5 by 11 book, colorful, big type, where us older people could could, could read. And what we did, uh, we put photos in there. It was meant to be a coffee table book. And what I planned on doing uh, by having this book was for the grandparents or whoever it may be, for that book to sit on their coffee table, when their grandkids came over, they would take the book out, they would have a conversation and go over the book with their grandkids and show them how life was 
in the mid 20th century, how they lived, uh, what they did, the games they played, the sports they uh, uh, were playing with other kids, and to show them how life was without the electronic devices that they have today, basically the cell phone and other things too. You know, the other day I was driving down the road and I, I saw a group of about, maybe about eight middle schoolers and they were standing on a corner and all eight of them were looking down at their cell phones. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wait a minute, who are they talking to? <laughs> Aren't they all there? They were probably talking to one another. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. You know, it's funny. I mean, um, I grew up, without cell phones and computers and we had black and white TVs and things like that. But I got to admit, I spend, I spend time looking at my phone too. So I'm, I'm guilty as charged. But I think when you mention about, you know, talking about simpler days, you know, going back and uh, reliving some things through stories, it's just, it's just fantastic. And I think that's, that's what you did so well in your first book and you're doing it well in your second book. What's the difference between the two books? Well, the first book was basically my memoirs of different experiences that I had growing up in Brooklyn. Many stories, I have put in uh, very short paragraphs. So there were so many things I had to write about that I didn't want the book to be overburdened with uh, one story. So I have many stories in there. And this particular book is very uh, few stories, but basically photos and poems. James, when I had my first book, I put about two or three poems in a book. Yes. And the uh, amount of people that sent me emails and contacted me that the poems were beautiful, it put tears in their eyes, it put joy to their face. They loved it. I thought this is an opportunity to start writing some more poems. And I have 15 poems in a new book. And each poem uh, is a different experience of not only growing up where I lived in Brownsville, but any part of Brooklyn. To give you an idea, I wrote about a Spaulding. Now, a Spaulding on my particular street was the Spaulding. Other people said, we never had a Spaulding. We had the Penzi Pinky. That's what they called the ball. They had a different ball. Uh, we played Johnny on a the Pony. They were saying, I play a game called Buck Buck. It's the same game. Uh, Skelly. They called it Skelzy. There were so many different names, but all of it was the same thing. All came from the imagination of the younger generation. They invented games, and it spread out all through Brooklyn, and not only Brooklyn, uh, the Bronx, other areas in the United States. They all witnessed this, the 1950s, 1960s, where it was just a beautiful, stress-free time where everyone enjoyed life. No one thought about uh, crime Everything was so joyful, and that's the reason why I wrote the second book. Yes, now let's talk about the poems. Did you ever write poems before your first book? You mentioned you put, which you did a couple in your first book, but did you ever write poetry before in your life, Marty? Never, never. I never uh, even read too many poems. You know, I'm an average guy. I don't, uh, I'm not that involved in reading a lot. I never was, but since I retired, about 11 years ago, I got more involved with my childhood. I look back and I say, gee, these were the greatest years, the best times I ever had. And believe me, uh, we had many great things in life and we enjoyed many different things together, my wife and I, Maxine. But when I look back at my Brooklyn days and I look at my friends and I look at the family and I look at the neighbors and everyone looking out for another, for one another, Mothers looking out their windows, making sure we were safe. And we were safe. We never thought about crime. And uh, life was just great during those 1950s, 1940s, and 1960s. Yeah, you know, uh, in the first interview with you, which was actually season three, episode six, you told about some of these stories in your memoirs. But your poems really tell stories too, don't they? That's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to put it in a certain form where uh, a grandchild get to understand how, th how things were in a, a poetic uh, style. Yeah, that's so true. You know, your first book sort of, uh, I mean, it definitely moved me. And it made me think about my childhood as well, which I think is what you really want people to do. You start thinking about 
those days and memories that we have that sometimes we don't think about that often because we're so busy living today all the time, right? Exactly. And, um, but when I started reading your poems in your new book, I got moved to tears. I honestly did. And, and I think one of the reasons I was is because the deep affection that you showed for your mom and dad. And there were a couple that stood out. They're all good, but there's a couple that stood out. And one of, them, one of them was called The Clothesline. Now you think, oh, a poem by the name of The Clothesline. Uh, what? <laughs> it is what it is. How, how poetic can we get about a clothesline? Well, you did. <laughs> Would you mind reading that poem to us? Sure. The Clothesline. Using a washboard was no easy chore. Mom rinsed clothes on her knees sitting on the floor. Scrubbing each garment and making them clean. In the 1950s, there was no such thing as owning a washing machine. The garments would hang on the clothesline to dry. The aroma from the fresh air would always satisfy. It hung in the alleyways in every direction. The buildings looked colorful without exception. During winter months, each garment took its own frozen shape. An intrinsic component of our urban landscape. Frozen clothes would be placed on the radiator to thaw. Being so stiff and big, there was no way they could fit in the drawer. The smell was enticing. The clothes sparkled like new. When I reminisce, each day is déjà vu. My mom worked so hard and never once complained. I'm sure by the end of the day, she had to be drained. After ironing the shirts, she was still not done. She would start to prepare dinner for everyone. I just wish I could thank her and tell her how much she's missed. I'd love to give her just one more big hug, along with a kiss. That is great. You know, uh, she wrote a little introduction to to each poem as well, uh, which is really helpful. You made me think about the clothesline in my childhood. And just not too long ago, we had a tree taken down in our backyard. It's the ho- I live in the house now that I grew up in. We bought it from my, my, my wife and I bought it from my mom probably about 30 years ago now. And we found a metal hook embedded in the side of the tree. <laughs> you know what that was. I know what that was. And I do remember my mother hanging laundry out, but a very long time ago. I was very young at the time. I guess one of the things I think about is when everybody had their laundry out, everybody kind of knew, you know, what everybody wore, you know, what was in their closet and in their drawer, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, when, when I look back and I uh, try to reminisce of how... Uh, the streets were. One thing that comes in mind all the time is the alleyways. It seems when you looked in the alleyway and you looked around, there were clothesline in every direction. Mothers, moms looking out the window, hanging out clothes. Usually they would do it on the early part of the week, hoping it wouldn't rain. But they did it in the summertime, they did it in the wintertime, the clothes would come out frozen. It was an experience just looking at people. I think I recall one time when a neighbor uh, ran out, she was baking something, and she yelled out to my mom on the other side of the window, uh, could you pass me uh, some sugar? I ran out of it. And my mom would take a bag of sugar, and she would put it on the clothesline and start on the pulley system. She would start moving it around so it moved to the other side of the street, and the neighbor would grab the sugar, and they would, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Blumberg, I appreciate it, and... That's how, that's how life was. Family at that time, neighbors at that time, it was all one big family. Everyone helped each other out. Everyone watched over each other. It was like an extended family, which uh, I, would, I think is terrific. Yeah, you know, when you mentioned about the clothes getting frozen, there was a lot of planning that went into hanging out your laundry because you had to worry about the weather. and the wh- What happened when it got really windy, by the way? Uh, when it got windy, it was things would fly off. The, you, you would be picking up all your garments along the alleyway, and it, there was a long, long snowstorm, and the clothes had to stay in that line for weeks. I had to wear my same underwear for like uh, two weeks until I was able to get my other pair off. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for dryers now, right? <laughs> but, but, but James, I, I was used to that because... My pants, uh, I didn't have the latest jeans. I would have knickers or I'd have my, uh, my 
older brother's pants that were handed down to my other older brother. I finally got the uh, pants probably about 15 years into it. And uh, we would roll up the cuffs. And as I grew, I would put the cuff down. And it fit me for like four or five years. And it didn't mean anything. It wasn't important to us to have the latest uh, Jordans or the biggest uh, designer stuff. What was important was that it kept us comfortable. That, that's what we felt. Now, you mentioned in your book that your dad bought a little repair kit for the oh, clothesline. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened, uh, like you mentioned on windy days, uh, my mother pulled too hard on the uh, rope. It would fall down and it would pull it off and they had to climb. Uh, we were on the first floor, so it wasn't bad. But there were people on the top floor that had to throw up a pulley for someone to catch and then tie it to their uh, window. And uh, this was the clothesline. This is how we dried our clothes. No one had washing machines, uh, dryers at that time. Even though they were just coming out, uh, they worked kind of hard. And I, I look at my mom, who was a very hardworking person, and uh, it's so, so different from what it is today. You know, women are out working, which is great, and they have jobs, but being home and taking care of a family and doing all these things was much harder, much harder. And... Uh, I think all our parents, we could say, did a great job. Yeah, did your mom ever have you pitch in to help in the clothes washing, drying process? Oh, yeah, yeah. She taught me how to iron even. I, I, she always told me when you iron a shirt, always do the collar first and then go along the, the front where the buttons are and then everything would fall into place. So I used to help her iron. You know, I was seven, eight years old. But uh, I'd love to help her because she worked so hard doing everything that it was a, an honor to share some of her chores. Do you remember, like, when the, the end of the day came around, like, later in the evening, did your mom ever kick her feet up? Or did you ever see her sort of, like, what people might say, chilling out now? Mm, I, I don't recall my mom chilling. You know, I, as I mentioned in my first book, you know, my mom had a uh, rheumatic heart condition, and she was always sick. And... Uh, you know, we lived in a very small apartment with two bedrooms, and my father, because he was a mailman, uh, I mentioned to you last time that he had to get up like 5 o'clock in the morning, so he had his own room. So here we are with one bedroom, five boys, my mom, all into uh, a studio uh, sofa that opened up into a couch, and we'd lay on the couch and watch TV, and everyone would be... I think that's one reason why you could say we had a very close family. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Poor mom. I think about it. so five five boys and your dad. Did she finally just give up putting the seat back down and say, you know, forget it? <laughs> it, it well, I, I think I, 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 I it, it didn't happen that way. But uh, I, I told you when I was born, she never told anyone I, she was pregnant. Uh, she went into Bethel Hospital, which is Brookdale Hospital, and she came back, and no one. No one knew that she was even pregnant. She used to wear these house dresses. And when she finally uh, got to uh, our apartment, there was no crib. And for the first uh, nine months of my life, I slept in the, ch uh, the chest, of, chest of drawers. With the, uh, I, I started in the sock drawer, and I got bigger. I went to the middle drawer. Finally, I got to the sweater drawer. There was no more room. No more drawers left. So we had to find another apartment. <laughs> How were your apartments heated? Each was heated with coal, very unhealthy. Uh, the coal truck would pull up. There was a big chute that came down that went into our basement. We were on the first floor, so all the dirty soot that would rise up would go into our apartment. Uh, it wasn't a healthy situation. The buildings were asbestos. It's amazing uh, how we all went through all this tough period of time, and things have changed today. Thank God for that, but it wasn't healthy at that time. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, one last thing on the clothesline when you talk about you know, the sugar being transported to the neighbor it reminds me of watching the Honeymooners. Uh, I don't know if you've oh, ever been a fan yeah, of that yes, show, yes, but yes. I remember. I think Trixie lowers a telephone down from the upstairs window <laughs> to Alex because <laughs> Ralph wouldn't spring I for a telephone. That. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way it was. So neighbors helping neighbors. So. Another one of the poems that really stood out was called Egg Cream. And this not only was a wonderful poem, and a testament sort of to your dad and how much you loved your dad, but it also made me kind of hungry. Could you 
read Egg Cream for us and tell us a little bit about why you wrote it and what it means to you. Okay, great. I'll read the poem first, The Egg Cream. An iconic drink I remember as supreme was made by my dad called a chocolate egg cream. It was a misnamed beverage for it contained neither egg nor cream. It was a combination of the three ingredients that made my face gleam. You mix it all together with seltzer milk and chocolate syrup made by you bet. It was a magical formula, one I'll never forget. It quenched our palates on hot summer days. It brings back happy memories in many ways. You may think I'm nostalgic and that I think too much of the past, but those were the years that went by much too fast. So I remember my mother making me something called a, she called it a melted. Uh, I'm, a malted. She called it a melted. My mother was from England. She called it a melted. She, I, don't, she, I don't think she got that right. But she called it a melted. <laughs> but it was kind of like what you describe, except that hers actually had an egg in it. Oh, yeah. Uh, like I mentioned, it's, it's, it's a misnamed be- a beverage. But the, uh, the egg cream was very popular. My father didn't make it, but you were able to go into the local candy store and you could order a, an egg cream. It was a very, very uh, quenching type of drink. And everyone, uh, that was one of the popular. We also had cherry Cokes. We had malteds, as you mentioned. We would go into uh, an ice cream parlor like Saul's or uh, Jen's. And we would order in fraps or ice cream sodas. Uh, there was always something to refresh us. Uh, in one of my poems we're not going to talk about today, there was a man that used to come around, a peddler. And what he would do is have a certain contraption on a piece of ice. And he would rub the contraption on the ice and he would make pour it into a, a paper cup. And there was different syrups you could choose. And there was ices. And he would sell it for like two cents, three cents. How much could ice, ice cost? And, <laughs> and, and, and kids would get refreshed with that too. That's cool. You know, I'm trying to picture... First of all, this was your dad's specialty. And I think in, it, you mentioned about how the, the syrup was sort of dripped down the side of the glass into the bottom, and your father would stir it up. There, there, right? is, there, there is a knack of making an egg cream, and uh, the chocolate syrup has to go right to the bottom, which it does. And you have to drink it pretty fast, because if you don't, the seltzer, the fizzle goes away, and it becomes flat. So my dad, when he used to make the egg cream, he used to tell us, uh, you have to drink this in five minutes. Don't don't let us stay around. And we used to gobble it down, and we used to have it that way. You know, in the uh, I, when I think about the uh, egg creams, and I think about ice cream shops, candy shops, I, I try to picture what it was like back in the fifties, walking into that, say, the soda shop or the or the candy yeah, shop. Well, what was the atmosphere like? Well, in those well James, I, I recall walking down the stoop of my house every morning. I would look out. It looked like that was our playground. The streets were a, a ball field. Uh, you would see hundreds of kids, literally hundreds of kids, each with their own age, each doing different things down the street. You would look around for your friends, what they were doing, and you would join them. There were kids playing Johnny on a Pony. There were kids playing hide and seek. There were kids playing kick the can. You name it. Then you would see peddlers walking down the street, one selling knishes. We had a guy, Ruby, that sold conditions on our street. And there was always something. The bungalow bar would come down and jingle his bills, and the kids would run t- and line up in, uh, on the side of the truck to get uh, different ice creams that they had. We had Miller Rolls. There was always a different ice cream coming out with. And we all enjoyed life, and kids would be playing different sports. The girls would be playing A My Name is Alice with a small dean. They would be riding a bike or kids were making scooters. I, I recall playing packs, which is a hail from your shoe, and you would throw it on a crack in a sidewalk. These are things that, it was like a playground that you didn't have to leave your street. There were two grocery uh, stores on our street. We had two candy stores. We had a food store. We had two drug stores. It was set up where it was a community, and your particular block served every need you needed. You didn't have to really travel around at that time. 
Yeah, just say it, it's almost like a magical place, I think, back in your memory, isn't it? Oh, it is. And the friends I had, and even today, I still keep in contact with some of my friends from uh, Brooklyn. It only brings happy smiles to me when I think about my childhood. Yeah, and I see the photographs that you put in the book. They're just uh, such cool stuff. And you got one of a, of a I guess you call it a, a soda jerk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, that, that's uh, you walked into a, a candy store. You know, they knew who you were. And they used to watch you. If you stayed too long, they would say, hey, make room for someone else. Because, you know, you had to have your soda, your frap, your ice cream soda, and leave. We used to hang outside the candy store. And the Brooklyn Dodgers, we spoke about uh, how... Each player, we compared the uh, few Yankee fans that were on our street and a few Giant fans to the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time. And this was the 50s. And in 51, uh, what happened, they played the Giants for the pennant. They both had the same exact records, even though the Brooklyn Dodgers was way ahead of the Giants during the season. But they started to play bad at the end. The Giants were playing good. And the final game, Bobby Thompson of the Giants hit a home run. And that was the hit, the shock that caused everything to stop. The Dodgers, they lost that. In 51, they lost that series. But in 55, they managed to come back and win the Yankees for the World Series. So there was a poem in there that I have about the Brooklyn Dodgers also. Yeah. In fact, all baseball, I, I remember as a kid walking down the street in the evening. Everyone had radio sitting on the stoops. It was hot. In the summertime, people didn't have air conditioning. So how they cooled off, they would sit on their stoops and listen to the radio. And as we were walking from one house to the next, we knew all the people. What score is it? This one got a hit. That one got a hit. By the time we got to the end of the street, we knew every every play-by-play. Play. <laughs> we didn't have to listen to the radio. We knew more than they did. Yeah, that is so cool. Now, I want to ask you this question, Marty. I've given you a couple of my favorites. Poems. What are some of your favorites from your book that you can share with us? Uh, I have one or two in mind that I'd like to share with you. One is called Spalding, not Spalding. And it just so happened, if you look at a Spalding, it's, it says Spalding, I-N-G at the end. That's how it's written by the company. Mm -hmm. But in Brooklyn, we didn't want to use an ing at the end. We use a dean. So we called it a spool dean. It sounded much easier to flow through our Brooklyn uh, accents. So, so th this tells about that particular uh, poem. When I was a kid, I do recall playing stickball against the wall. We would use chalk to color in home plate. Some games lasted more than four hours straight. We also played it on the street using a broomstick as a bat. One kid was nicknamed the sewer rat. We used the Swaldeen. Its color was pink. When pulled from the sewer, it had a bad stink. <laughs> it got lost on the ruse, even rolled down the sewer, and wiping it down, it looked even newer. The Swaldeen bounced very high when a kid connected. It traveled through the sky. There were multiple games you could play with the Swall, hit the penny, stoop wall, and a game called off the wall. It was part of our childhood that I'll never forget. Playing in the streets was never a threat. I miss those games, but remember them well. Even today, I could sense that new ball smell. I tell this to my grandchildren of those days gone by. I guess they think I'm just an old-fashioned guy. Sometimes they stare at me like I'm kind of weird. There are many times they think I'm getting a little impaired. Other times they think I'm in the twilight zone. Sometimes they smirk and smile, then go back to their phone. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> Oh, that is great. Now, I understand that you had a plan uh, when you were a kid if you ran out of your Spaldines. Oh, we did have a plan. And uh, rather than spend uh, 25 cents for a Spaldine, I don't think I ever bought a Spaldine that was uh, new from the store. We used to go on the roofs, collect all these Spaldines, and many of the balls would roll down the sewer. And I mentioned in this poem, we had a guy called this, one of our, my friends was called the Sewer Rat. He only weighed about 30 pounds. He was a little kid, and we used to hold him by his uh, the toes and his, uh, his ankles, and we used to lower him down into the sewer, and he used to retrieve the balls. If he wasn't around, 
we would make up uh, from the broomstick, uh, from a hanger, a little round uh, circle, was able to scoop the balls off. And if we didn't have that, we would go to the grocery store. And the grocery store was always kind of small. And they had a certain contraption where if you squeeze it, you could take a box down from the top shelf. And we used to, if we, if we didn't have any other way of getting the ball from the sewer, we would ask the grocery man, we would say, could we loan you a stick? We would go use his stick, squeeze it, and it would hold the small dean in the sewer, and we'd bring it up, and then we wouldn't even wipe it down. We just gave it back to him. I wouldn't want to buy any of that stuff after that. <laughs> You're just, you're just doing some picking in the sewer with it. Here, let me get down your uh, bag of cookies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is, you know, I got to ask you this. Um, I've never been a very good baseball player, but how the heck did you hit that little ball with a broomstick? You know, it's in proportion. Uh you know, the Spalding was uh, smaller than the baseball. The broomstick was very narrow, but if you the ball was thrown on a bounce. We used to play it on a bounce. You could also throw it on the fly. And the whole idea with the Spalding, it was more or less a tennis ball without the fuzz on it. You were able to put your finger in it. And when you threw the ball, you would make, make that ball spin and curve and jump. And it was like a, uh, these pitches nowadays that throw curveballs. That's how we used to do it. And if you lined it up, after a while, some kids would hit two or three sewers. That was the unit of measure at that time, how many sewers you could hit. And uh, one thing I like, whether you were a good hitter, a one sewer hitter, a half a sewer, everyone was always chosen for the game. Yes, the guys that were really good, they would be chosen first because they could hit the furthest. But we always included even nine players. Even if they couldn't hit, they always all played in the game. And when the ball went flying, everyone would yell, car, car. And everyone would, so, so the outfielder wouldn't run into a running car. There weren't too many cars around driving around, but there was enough to be careful. Sometimes they would hit a pop ball and we'd have to, to try to catch it. You'd have to crawl under a car, go in between two cars, put your hand out, and hopefully you're able to catch that ball. And uh, it was a, a really great experience. Oh, man. Who taught you how to play? It's a natural thing. There were so many kids around. There were so many games. That's just one game. We played with that Spalding stoop wall, off the wall, pick up. There was a game pick up where you had to catch the ball on a short hop. Everyone was inventing games. We had baseball cards. We just didn't have a box to trade them with. What we would do was throw the baseball cards against the wall uh, we would have leaners. We would try to knock them down. There were so many things going on. On the holidays, we would throw nuts against the wall, little wall. There was like, there was always a game, always something to, uh, that we invented, and we were never bored. You had uh, older brothers, so to your knowledge, your oldest brother is how many years older than you? Uh, my oldest brother was born 1930. I was born 41. So you figure it out. We were all about uh, three, four years apart. Yeah. Did he play the same games you did? He played the same games, maybe different rules, but they all played the same games. And as you got older, you went into a more, uh, a different type of game. Mm. We used to play sidewalk slap ball. And it was on a sidewalk. Our parents said, don't go on the gutter. So we played on the, as soon as we got a little older, we went on the gutter to play. So, you know, it was different. <laughs> and the older kids weren't on the gutter. <laughs> oh, that's great. Marty, can you give us another one of your poems? Yes. The name of my second book was Going Back to Brooklyn. I wrote a poem about going back to Brooklyn. One of the comments I get from most of my readers is that, gee, I wish I could go back in time. I wish I could go back, see my mom. I wish I could kiss her again. I wish I could hug my dad. I wish I could see my siblings and play with them, my friends. And I miss those days, and I love those days, and I do want to go, I, I wish I could go back. Mm. And I thought about that, and that's how I got the name from the book, because that's the most common thing I heard. Uh, I want to go back to Brooklyn. And this is my experience of the poem, Going Back to Brooklyn. Now that I have grown old, I hope my wish comes true. A trip back to Brooklyn, the neighborhood where I grew. I can't wait to visit the stores I once knew. I wonder if they'll remember me. I just hope they do. 
Yes, I'll stop by Ambush Street where I was born. I hope I am recognized since my pants are not torn. I'll take my Spalding just in case we have a game. Hoping being older doesn't cause me any pain. I'll check out the front window where my mom always sat. She'll probably ask me to put on a sweater or a hat. I'll knock at my door and ask if I could take a peek, hoping that would let me in, noticing I was old and weak. I'll wait on the front stoop until my dad returns from work. I'm sure when he sees me, he'll really have a perk. But wait, that was me the kid over 75 years ago, and things may not be the same. It's possible I won't be remembered, not even my name. What if my building turned to rubble and the streets are in despair? Nothing would help me then, not even a prayer. It may be best to stay away and not go back in time. As long as I have my memories, that will be sublime. I could reminisce about the experiences of being a boy. Those were the days that were truly a joy. How has writing, I can say it about both books, but how has writing going back to Brooklyn impacted you? Uh, it's done a lot for me because I'm able to share my memories with my peers. I'm able to share my memories so people of my age could look back and say, gee, I forgot about that. And Marty reminded me of those times. And I recall everything he says is true. And I love those days just like he does too. It gives them a chance to reminisce and to talk about their great feelings and love and talk this way to their grandchildren and their children. And it, it keeps a period that I do not want to be forgotten. I'd like everyone to understand that this was a, the best era. There was just a terrific environment. We never thought about any uh, crime and anything like that. And it should be remembered because it was a very, very fruitful and helpful uh, time of our lives. How did writing the poems, a book that is mostly poems, sort of really enforce that for you, those feelings? Well, I have the feelings and I, I've put it to rhyme. And by putting it to rhyme, it, it brings out my feelings much stronger. I'm happy I did it that way because it makes it very easy to reminisce by listening to these poems. It sort of hit it home for me when I read the poems because I think it being put to rhyme, uh, the, the words that you used just made me think about my childhood. I'm, I'm a little behind you. I, was, I grew up in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And I grew up in the suburbs. I didn't grow up in, in the city. But it did remind me of times that I spent with my grandparents, my parents, listening to their stories. It reminded me of flipping baseball cards. It reminded me of playing pickup football games. Right. We'd be all walking around. It'd be the summertime. What do you want to do? No, I don't know. What, what do you want to do? And all of a sudden, we would invent a game. Exactly. We would play, sometimes we would play army. Sometimes we would play, you know, we'd pick up a basketball or we would play kickball or tag or hide and go seek or whatever we did. But it was always some part of our imagination we had to use. How about, uh, I, I think we have time for at least one more poem uh, that's your favorite, one of your favorites. Could you share it with us? Sure. Uh, when I was younger, and I would play out in the streets from morning until the lights went on at night. Uh, moms would be looking out their window, calling their children, the girls, the boys. It's dinner time. And one thing I recall is sitting down for dinner with my family, all sitting around a table, all talking about what we did that day, what, what activities we had. And it was family time at that time. And I don't know whether we still have that nowadays. Everyone's so busy. But I did write a poem called Family Dinners. Family Dinners. I remember family dinners, conversations at the table. Kids giving their opinion whenever they were able. Mom wearing her apron, cooking and serving food. We all help with chores, never being rude. Today is so much different. Family values are not the same. Today, kids rather talk on their phone or use their Xbox playing a game. Our meals were hot from the oven. Today, it's ready-made. 
We would help mom clear the dishes before we went out and played. Today, kids would rather leave the table. Politeness is not their word. Never hearing a thank you. I remember as a child, that's all I ever heard. We were always active, mostly playing in the street, using our imaginations in a manner always being discreet. And when darkness came, moms would call us from their window, saying it's dinner time, telling us to end the game. We played stickball with a small dean, using a broomstick as a bat. First base was the car front tire. It always had a flat. Hitting two sewers was a tremendous blast. That was a unit of measure then. Scoring with a chalk on the gutter rather than use a leaky fountain pen. The girls would bounce their small dean. They played A My Name is Alice. Then they jump rope. It was like living in a palace. The boys would flip baseball cards, then play hide and seek, always keeping busy each and every week. Life was simple. We were innocent, even if we got hurt with pain. We just picked ourselves up, never to complain. Kids were so much happier, even though their pants were torn. We didn't need designer sneakers, even if ours was worn. We were happy to get new laces and had our shoemaker do repair. When we needed a haircut, we would ask the barber, could you just trim my hair? My mom would wash our clothes by hand and hung it out to dry, hoping it would not rain and in the morning have sunshine. If you recall those childhood years, I have one thing more to say. You had a great childhood, so thank God each and every day. Uh, that, that's great. I've always believed that the two most important times that you can spend with your kids are at the dinner table and right before bed. Because I... I believe that those are the two times specifically that you find out the most about what went on in their day and what was on their mind. And I think in these days with sports and different, you know, work schedules and activities that uh, not as much time is spent around the dinner table. And I think uh, we really miss out as families when we do that, because those are the times that you learn to listen and also feel more free to open up and tell people what's going on with you. So anyway, that's the way I feel. Yes. So Marty, what do you hope the younger generation will glean from reading your book? Well, two words come to my mind very, very uh, fast, and that's family values. Family values are very important to me, and I always feel should be close, and there should be a correspondence, a uh, relationship. Parents should know exactly what kids are doing. Kids should know what parents are doing. And I just hope that kids reading my book nowadays or knowing about it, that it shows that family is very important. You can lose a lot of things in life, but your parents are always around for you. You should hug them, kiss them. Life is short. We don't have that many years where we could prolong everything, and we should take advantage of every minute we have now. Uh, kiss your mom, hug your dad, They're your family, and whatever they do, believe me, they're looking for your benefit. Well said and very true. Sometimes we do take people for granted, not necessarily like, oh, I don't care about them, but oh, they'll always be here. Or, yeah. Oh, they're there, they're always there. What better way to honor the previous generation and our childhoods than by telling their stories and particularly in poems. I think so too. So Marty, you've got two terrific books out. What are your plans for the future? It has to be something else cooking on the burner. Well, James, right now I'm thinking of one thing. What got me excited was there was a, a new show going on CBS called East New York. And I live very close to East New York. And I couldn't wait for the show to start. I stayed up to 9.30, which is very late for me to watch the show. <laughs> After a half hour, I went to sleep. Uh, I would love, if this is all possible, and hopefully in the future I could work on something like this, maybe co-direct or something like that, is to bring back the 50s in a series East New York was all about crime, all about uh, things with policemen and cops and people with drugs. And it's not the way I really want Brooklyn to be remembered. In my heart, I'd like to see a show eventually, and I'd love to work on that, where 
we would take you back to a certain area. It could be Bensonhurst, it could be Bay Ridge, it could be Canarsie, it could be Coney Island, Sheepshead Bay, you name it. Every area has their own stories. And to bring it back and to show how kids played in the street and how, how life was during the 50s, that would be a tremendous show. If people would love that. And that's something I, I, I'd like to figure out a way of maybe putting some of my stories into a, uh, a series, a TV type of thing, uh, maybe a Netflix or something like that, and get the average person to see how life was during those times. That would be terrific. I would love to see that. I would love to get behind something like that because, as you've mentioned before, the people who have experienced those days, the 50s, and or growing up in Brooklyn, will be able to sort of, it's nostalgic. It just brings back great memories and cheerful memories. And then for people who are younger, it's a sense of history. Where did What was life like back in that era? And, and what can we learn from it? And how can we replicate it in some ways? Exactly. Uh, to bring back family values and, and f making fun out of nothing. I mean, I think... There's so many games and so much information and so much available at our fingertips now, including this podcast. <laughs> but back then, you had to kind of create it, didn't you? You had to create it uh, on almost on a daily basis. I agree. It, it shouldn't die. We should live it on and keep it up and let people know about this terrific time in our lives uh, and to all uh, witness this again in our own way. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking about, as a kid, making up our own fun. It didn't come without a cost once in a while, though. For instance, I remember once, I mean, I don't have any hair now, but I remember playing a game with Silly Putty and getting it stuck in my hair and cutting my hair with scissors <laughs> and had a big hole in the middle of my head. Maybe that's why I went bald. I don't know. <laughs> I remember that. I also remember playing Army with my friends, and I stepped backward off a wall and fell about four feet and hit my head in the driveway. I swung from... <laughs> a wall, and it swung right into a tree like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. And I'm wondering, maybe, Kelly's wondering, maybe that explains it, you know? <laughs> but, 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 but James, you, you know, what you're saying is true. And yet, we didn't wear helmets riding bikes. We didn't, uh, we, we, so many things we didn't do, but yet we all turned out healthy. We turned out fine. And uh, who knows? Who knows with all these things? But uh, it, it's a great experience, a great great time in my life and I'm sure many people listening to this podcast experience the same things I experience. It didn't matter what area they're from, it's still Brooklyn and Brooklyn should always be remembered. Terrific. And how can people get a copy of your book going back to Brooklyn? Great. They could get a copy on any seller, any bookseller has it uh, from Barnes & Noble to uh, Walmart, Target, Amazon has it and it's available through Kindle as well, and uh, that's very inexpensive. If they do buy the book, they have the opportunity to keep it on their coffee table, make sure any friends that come over, any kids that come over, their grandchildren come over, take it out and let them see it and uh, let them discuss it. Yeah, that's great. And also I encourage people to, if they haven't, to listen to Your History, Your Story podcast from Season 3, Episode 6 which was titled My Brooklyn, My Way, uh, which is the name of uh, your first book. And I wanted just to say that I am so thankful that you were able to meet with us in person this time, and it was a lot of fun. And you're a great storyteller, and I hope you continue to tell stories because you bring history alive and you bring family values alive. And I just love that. Thank you, James. I appreciate you inviting me and Kelly and uh, I had a great time, and uh, hopefully we'll meet in another year or two, and maybe there may be something else we'll talk about. We'll be hopefully talking about your new series on TV, <laughs> if I hope. But Marty, thank you again. God bless, and we'll be talking to you soon. God bless you, too. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.